Good, uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our public health conversation. I'm Sandro Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the School of Public Health at Boston University. This is one of our series of public health conversations that we host at the school to discuss together, have conversations about the salient public health issues of our time. Before I start, I thank you to people who make these events happen, it's the, the uh, people in the Dean's Office at the Boston University School of Public Health, particularly Alicia Noel and Meredith Brown. Thank you. I'm very excited about today's conversation. Today, we, are, we have a conversation that's based around a book authored by Professors Jennifer Hirsch and Seamus Khan, Sexual Citizens, Landmark Study of Sex, Power, and Assault on Campus. You're going to hear more about that from Dr. Rothman. Uh, what we're doing today is, um, is a different format than usual. We're going to do a conversation interview style with Professor Rothman asking questions of Professors Hirsch and Khan, followed by questions from the audience. So we're very much looking forward to audience engagement. Our conversation is going to be moderated, as I said, by Professor Emily Rothman. Professor Rothman joined the VU School of Public Health in 2004 as a faculty member in the Department of Community Health Sciences. Uh, she has participated in several university-led committees that have dealt specifically with this issue we're talking about today, with the issue of sexual assault on campus, and conducted multiple research studies on sexual and dating violence and how these issues affect Boston University, other college students, young adolescent, and college-age military personnel. She has represented our university well at numerous national level sexual violence prevention activities. She's also the author of a forthcoming book uh, to be published by Oxford University Press called Pornography and Public Health. I have learned enormously from um, uh, Professor Rothman and I've also learned tremendously from reading the book by Professors Hirsch and Khan. So I'm very much excited about today's event. Thank you everybody for joining us. Professor Rothman, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Dean Galea for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this conversation, everybody. I am really glad to be joining all of you for this critically important and timely discussion and uh, to have the honor of introducing our accomplished presenters. The topic of sexual assault on college campuses is of cru crucial importance to the health and well being, not only of millions of young adults in the US, but to all of the people who care about, support, and teach them. When one young person is sexually assaulted, it often has ripple effects uh, that mean that family and friends and community and sometimes uh, entire institutions are affected. Lately, this topic has taken on new dimensions of salience for me as I parent my two teenage daughters and try to help them make sense of competing messages about how our world and our society operates in terms of sex and sexuality and, and power and sexual politics. And given that so many sexual norms still reflect misogynistic double standards, racism, homophobia, cis sexism, and ableism. Today, we're so fortunate uh, to hear from two exceedingly talented and insightful scholars whose work has elevated the national and international discourse about sexual assault and sexual citizenship on college campuses. As you'll hear, their contributions reflect incisive analysis about young adult sexuality. Their book is based on years of research, interviewing and observing college life. It's been called Profoundly Eye-Opening by the editor of the journal Violence Against Women, Timely, Authentic and Revolutionary by J. Dennis Fortenberry, the Donald Orr Professor of Adolescent Medicine at the Indiana University School of Medicine, Grounded in Young People's Lived Experiences and Voices by Vicki Banyard, Professor at Rutgers University, and Extraordinary and a Book That Needs to Be Read by our very own Dean Galea. I'm gonna start the uh, conversation off with brief introductions. I am honoring a request from our pre presenters to limit their introduction to one sentence each. So with that in mind, uh, Jennifer Hirsch is a professor of sociomedical sciences at the Columbia Mailman School of Public Health. Seamus Khan is a professor of sociology at Columbia University. They are also, of course, highly accomplished, internationally recognized, well-respected, and well-liked scholars with many accolades between them. Our speakers have selected to use a conversation format for this presentation rather than giving a lecture. So I'm going to begin the conversation by asking some questions of my own. Uh, but as a reminder, questions from the audience are a facet of today's seminar. So please use the Q&A function to submit your questions. Uh, one final note before I begin uh, the conversation. Our discussion of the book Sexual Citizens may contain descriptions of actual sexual assaults as students experience them. 
And this material can be hard to listen to. Uh, we know that in every room, virtual or not, there are survivors. Uh, I'm going to make sure that we put the RAIN National Sexual Assault Hotline number in the chat window, but it's 800-656-4673, 800-656-HOPE. So please take care of yourselves and know that you're not alone if you struggle with today's content. So, uh, Dr. Hirsch and Dr. Khan, I wonder if you can please bring us back to the very beginning of your process. Why did you write this book? Um, so first of all, uh, Emily, uh, we're, we're so happy to be with you. We wish we could be with you obviously in person, but we're um, delighted to be at this event and, and grateful for the space to be in conversation. Um, so I'm gonna start my answer to your question with a story. Um, Austin was in so many ways a very engaging interview subject. Um, the only kind of spicy sex scene in the book features Austin and his girlfriend on a hot summer night. It was the 4th of July. They made their own fireworks. It's in the book. Um, and he had developed even a set of nicknames with his girlfriend for the kinds of orgasms that she would have. So he had grown into a man who was very committed to um, uh, not just to being a good boyfriend, but specifically to being a good lover. Um, and yet he told us a story about freshman year, what he initially called a weird experience, where he was shuffled off into another bedroom, not his own, so his roommate could be alone with his roommate's girlfriend. In that bedroom was a young woman um, in bed. Uh, she said to him that she was drunk and that she didn't want to do anything. And like, that alone should give you pause because why should you have to tell a stranger in your bedroom that you don't want them to touch you? Like that, it's your, it, you're in your own bed, in your own room. Um, and he didn't listen to her. He got in bed with her and um, he started to touch her body. And then he stopped himself. Um, and as, as he went through the interview, so he initially called it, as I said, a weird experience. But then later we asked him, well, what is a sexual assault? And he knew what a sexual assault was and he answered the question. And then he paused and his eyes welled up with tears. And he said, fuck me. Like he was, he was so wrecked in that moment to, to finally acknowledge what he had done because he couldn't put together being a good person with having potentially really harmed someone. Um, and so we wrote Sexual Citizens to expand the national conversation about campus sexual assault to include prevention. Um, in 2014, when I started the project um, out of which uh, Sexual Citizens was born, uh, there was so much conversation about campus sexual assault. The you know, Obama White House um, had handed down the Dear Colleague letter and student activists were making change in campuses all over the country. And yet most of the focus was on adjudication. Mm -hmm. And that is important. Um, but we're social scientists and I'm a public health person. I spent my whole career thinking about what it means to go beyond working one penis at a time, you know, to, to really take a population level approach. And I thought, let's do this, let's do this research that looks expansively at how sexual assault is designed into the campus context so we can think about designing it out. Wonderful, thank you. Dr. Khan, do you wanna to add to that at all? No, I think I'll, I'll sort of layer on to what Jennifer says as we move through the conversation and she'll do the same with, with me. Okay, I'll leave it to you guys to, to jump in when you feel it's right. Uh, so I'm wondering if um, we are a public health uh, audience primarily, can you briefly outline for us your research methods uh, and, and maybe why you chose those methods? What were the strengths and limitations that you saw of using those particular methods? Uh, and then I think we're also interested in how did you recruit subjects under the topic of methods? How did you recruit people into this study? Absolutely. So, um, you know, obviously it's, it, it seems like it's probably not that easy to recruit people to talk with you about sex and which is part of what we did as well as to talk with you about sexual assault. Um, and I'm just going to take a step back and, 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 um, Jennifer and I were part of a much larger project. So Sexual Citizens, the book uh, that our conversation is based off, 
is grounded in the ethnographic portion of a study called SHIFT. And by ethnographic, I'll sort of explain that for the non-public health professionals in the audience in a moment. And SHIFT was a large scale kind of moonshot project that Jennifer co-led with Claude N. Mellons that used multiple def different techniques to understand um, sexual assault at Columbia College, um, the School of Engineering, at Barnard College and the School of General Studies. So what we might call Columbia University and Barnard. And that included a, a series of quantitative studies, surveys and daily diaries that sought to capture you know, a large number of students and give us a portrait of their experiences, um, as well as a series of qualitative studies, which Jennifer and I co-led, and I'll explain in a moment, and then an intervention piece, a community intervention piece. And the idea there was that we, we didn't wanna just produce findings, but instead help our community transform. Um, so SHIFT stood for the Sexual Health Initiative to Foster Transformation, and we wanted to not just study campus life, but to transform it for the better. Now the ethnographic portion that Jennifer and I co-led had a series of studies within it. Um, one was a s interviews and we interviewed 151 students um, for about two hours each, getting a sense of their life before college and in college, their experiences with their families, with alcohol and drugs, with their friends, and most importantly, their sexual experiences, including experiences with sexual assault. And important for the listeners to know is that we didn't just ask about sexual assault. Instead, we put sexual assault in conversation with other kinds of sexual experiences. We also ran focus groups, 17 focus groups that sought to get students to collectively talk about their experiences and understandings of sexual assault and sex on campus. And some of these were general groups, some of them were only with students of color or first generation students or LGBTQ or religious student groups to get sort of a sense of how students communicated uh, about this. But what students say and what they do is not always the same. And so I think what makes the project a little bit different than a lot of other projects was the participant observation. And participant observation means embedding in the lives of the community that you're studying. So, um, Jennifer and I embedded in the public life of Columbia and Barnard. That meant going to sports games and being in the dining hall and, you know, hanging out with some students in public spaces and observing them navigate their day-to-day -day life. But we're kind of too old um, in, a, in a sense of like, if we just showed up at a party, it would be very notable, but also like Jennifer and I go to bed at 10, 10 p.m. and are up at 5 a.m. And so most campus life happens after we're in bed. And so we hired a group of younger um, uh, uh, doctoral students, people who just finished their doctoral work and public health students, five of them to do participant observation, to embed in campus life in sororities and fraternities, in religious student organizations, on intramural sports teams, hanging out with students as they made dinner in their dorm suites to get a sense of the day-to-day -day lived experience. And the aim of this is to pull back the curtain on the college experience. And conceptually, the idea is that in order to understand sexual assault, we, don't, we need to understand kind of the very structure of our institutions and everyday life. If we think about sexual assault as just a pathology, something that really broken people do who want to harm others, then it isn't important to understand our social institutions. But if we think of a sexual assault as Jennifer and I do, as in some ways produced by the environments that we've built, then we need to study those environments and the techniques that we used in our participant observation and our ethnography helped us do that. Um, and so just to add on a little bit about how we recruited people, um, uh, one of the, the most delightful parts of what was in many ways a really hard project um, to, to implement was we had a, a group of undergraduates who served as an advisory board to us. And we met with them every Monday at 8 a.m. That time was their choice because it was the only time that they were all free, but they showed up every Monday um, and not just for the breakfast. For them, it was, um, several of them told us it was the best experience of their whole college education. Um, 
I, I, because they would tell us what to do and we would take it into account and we would actually do it. And so we, in, we introduced the interviewers to them and they helped us think not just about the diversity of the campus in terms of types of students, but in terms of types of social events and the social calendar. And so we had um, a purposive sampling strategy to recruit uh, people into the ethnography to, in, in a way that would represent the breadth of campus life, not just in terms of, not just demographically, but, but uh, socially. Um, so the, our, our ethno team, as we called them, did some of the recruiting. We posted flyers around campus, you know, have you had a weird experience with sex you want? Like, you know, have you been sexually assaulted? So we posted a variety of flyers around campus, um, uh, developed in collaboration with the, the undergraduates in terms of like the different motives that people would have for participating. Um, one thing that was very striking about the recruitment was that we sent an email out from just like the, the anonymous shift account announcing the survey. Um, and we got people who were just, you know, to the whole undergraduate student body. And we got people who responded saying that they had a story to tell. And so people who, you know, as you know, mandated reporting means that people can't tell their stories in a public way to the university without triggering some kind of official response. And so this was like um, uncapping a geyser in terms of students' eagerness to share their experience in a way that would be heard. I, I mean, I'll never forget one, one young woman after telling me the story of assaulting her gay best friend said, I want you to tell President Bollinger my story. Like she really had, um, had suffered as a result of causing harm to him. And she wanted, she wanted the, her suffering to be um, used for good. But so the students, they really, really wanted, there were some who came forward because they wanted to tell us their stories. Um, and then, you know, the people who didn't show up, I think are also important. Um, there are, I think probably in every community, people who seek to intentionally harm others and someone who um, does that is unlikely to volunteer to be in a study about sexual assault. And so, you know, and those stories are important to tell. And I think that they have been told. I mean, so if you read Chantal Miller's book or you read Lacey Crawford's book, like, that, so those are very important. That's another part of the story, um, but it's not the part that we tell. And I think it, what's particularly striking about who we recruited is that we ended up hearing from many people who had assaulted other people because they thought they were having sex. Um, so, so uh, anyway, that was a long answer, so. <laughs> no, it was, it was a great answer. And I actually wanna pick up on something that you said uh, in, in there. Would you say a little bit more about how you navigated those mandated reporting policies that campuses have? Some people in the audience might be wondering, how is it possible to do this research? and hear these stories. Did you have to make mandated reports? Why or why not? No, we we reserved, reserved, we uh, secured an exemption from mandated reporting requirements. So in starting this research, one of the things that we knew we had to do was not be subject to mandated reporting. And for those of you who are listening who don't know what that is, um, uh, part of the federal requirements uh, for institutions is that um, people be designated as mandatory reporters. And what that means is that if a student tells someone who's designated as a mandatory reporter about an experience of an assault, that person has to report that assault to the institution. And as faculty members, Jennifer and I are categorized as mandatory reporters. So anytime we hear about an assault, we're required to report it. But as we know from years of research in sexual assault, only a fraction of sexual assaults are actually reported to the institution. So in the survey portion that Claude Mellons led, we ended up finding that around 3% of the incidences that people told us about, they actually reported to the institution. It's a tiny, tiny fraction. And what, what it would have meant if we had to report things is a huge selection into our study. And so uh, Jennifer really led this effort with the Office of the General Counsel um, to secure an opinion that from that council that for the purposes of our research, so not in our day-to-day -day lives as faculty members, but as researchers, 
we would be exempt from this requirement, which meant that we were able to gather all kinds of stories that people probably wouldn't have told us or stories from people who never would have shown up in a room to talk to us if they knew that we were gonna report what they experienced. That's very helpful. Thank you for that. Um, let me move on to the next question. This book is centered around three big ideas, sexual citizenship, sexual projects, and sexual geographies. Uh, these are the lens through which you make sense of sexual assault. Can you please define those terms for people uh, so we're all on the same page with what you mean by those terms? And then what do you hope will be the, the big take home from reading this book? Um, so sexual citizenship means a person's right to choose their own experiences and their understanding that other people have that same right. So that, that we are um, all citizens. Um, uh, and that term, I mean, there's a reason we chose that as the title of the book, um, because it's a little bit of a provocation. Our argument there is that we can't effectively move the needle on campus sexual assault unless we give young people a message that goes beyond sex is bad and dangerous and don't hurt other people. So unless we acknowledge that young people have a right to choose sexual experiences, we can't prepare them to have sex in a way that doesn't hurt other people. Um, sexual projects answers the question of what sex is for. If you think back to the story I told about Austin, um, in that moment, Austin's sexual project was just acquiring experience. He was very anxious because he felt like as many people are when they start college because they feel like everyone else has more sexual experience than they do. And so he just wanted to like get good at sex. Um, uh, and so student sexual projects vary, you know, um, so for some of them, uh, it was about status. For some of them, uh, it was actually about expressing care. Um, in some instances, it was about seeking pleasure. Um, and, you know, we are agnostic about what is the best sexual project. I think that that's something that, you know, we're not judgy as researchers about that. I'm judgy as a mom about that. Um, but uh, sexual projects is something that people need to figure out for themselves and they tend to change over the arc of college. And then sexual geographies, um, which comes from my prior work, uh, is the idea that space matters, that space is actually a, an element that constitutes sexuality, not just the backdrop, not just the scenery. I mean, think about the room that Austin entered and the sort of, in pre-COVID times, tidal flow of students in and out of each other's dorm rooms. And we're not, you know, saying that we should bring back parietals, those rules that, you know, um, you couldn't have an opposite sex person in, in, you know, in your bedroom, but that in all kinds of ways, both at the micro level of the dorm room and at the macro level of the campus, um, sexual geographies is part of what produce campus sexual assault. Um, I, so I think the, the biggest take home that we want, I mean, the book um, is relatively optimistic for a book on sexual assault because we feel like in our vision, we propose solutions that could really work for prevention. Um, and so what we want people to take away from reading it is that everyone is a stakeholder in campus prevention. We can't solve campus sexual assault if we just treat it as a campus problem. We need to bring in families and K through 12 education and religious communities. Um, so we want people to see that they are part of the solution and then to be part of the solution. Excellent. Um, my next question is about the topic of race. So race comes up prominently in the book. Can you talk to us a bit about the intersection of race, racism, and sexual assault on campus? Absolutely. You know, Jennifer and I build upon a long tradition, um, a scholarly tradition of gender and power, which thinks about how sexual assault is the product of inequitable gender relations. But we also know that gender isn't the only form of power on campus. And so let me give you a story. And it's a story of um, a woman we call Charisma. And everybody that we speak of, we change their names um, and some identifying features in order uh, to protect their identities and their stories. Um, Charisma uh, 
talk to us about the challenges of being in what she referred to as a white space, campus as a white space. And what she meant by that was like, she, you know, she described freshman year where um, the frat parties were filled with, in her description, white guys who couldn't dance, drank too much, listened to terrible music and didn't find women like her attractive. And so Charisma, um, you know, kind of looked outside of campus life for um, potential partners. And she met one uh, through her roommate uh, and he lived way out in Brooklyn. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the geography of, of New York, Brooklyn is only, you know, five, 10 miles from uh, Morningside Heights, but it takes a long time to get there on the weekend. Like, you know, it easily can take 90 minutes. And so she went way out to Brooklyn to meet this guy and he assaulted her there. And there's a lot more to this story than that, you know, as, as quickly as I'm moving through it. But it's important to recognize that part of Charisma's experience of assault was being driven out of a campus space that for her was defined by whiteness. Another example of this is that every single black woman that we spoke to told us a story of unwanted sexualized touching. It sort of bears repeating every single black woman we talked to. Now, you could think about that as a problem of gender and power, but you would miss how that is a form of racialized violence where recognition of those women's bodily autonomy was something that the, the, the women's classmates were just unwilling to do. They thought of black women's bodies as accessible or touchable. We also heard stories from black men about fears of false accusation. And you know, we heard many stories about fears of false accusation among men. We'll just note that those fears are overblown given the likelihood of a false accusation. But for black men, the fears were particularly acute. In one case, so extreme that a young man after having sex with a woman recorded her saying that she had had a great time. And then he reported to us that he'd confirmed that New York state was a one party consent state so that his recording was legally admissible as evidence in his defense in court. And that degree of fear that he experienced was far more extreme than any we previously heard. And it can't be understood independent of the racialization of campus life and black men's experiences of policing, not just in New York, but in the United States more generally. If we take a step back from this, it fits much more broadly this argument about race within a range of arguments that Jennifer and I make about equality as being a fundamental feature of all sexual assault prevention programming. That the pathway to preventing sexual assault is not only in producing equality on campus, but it's in thinking about how it is that we can create campuses and other kinds of institutions as more equitable spaces. And I'll just finally say, if we remember the story that of Charisma from 30 seconds ago, so I guess remember probably not a great way of putting it, um, the fact that white men had a lot of control over the party spaces on campus, particularly through fraternity life in Columbia's instance, but that realization that white men frequently have a lot of control over spaces where events happen is a recognition of the power of, say, of the concept of sexual geographies and realizing that sexual geographies are not just sexual geographies, but they're sexual geographies that are also racialized, that are embedded within class relationships and all kinds of other inequitable dynamics. Thank you for that. Um, it's a powerful answer. And I think it's a really powerful story in the book. Um, I guess it makes me think a little bit about, you know, um, there have been times where parents have asked me, how do I advise my sons who are going off to college? Should they get one of these apps uh, where you record, you know, their checklists and people agree to have sex with you and you get their signature before you have sex with them? Are these a good idea? Um, have you been asked those similar kinds of questions? And, and, and what do you tend to say to those parents or to people who are, who are, who very legitimately often maybe have fears uh, of, you know, that type of um, regulation, but, but how do you advise people? Um, so we use the driving metaphor, 
you know, and it's nice to speak with a public health audience because you know that we have done a pretty good job at making driving, which is a dangerous behavior, safe. But it kids don't just grab the keys on the way out the door while they're drunk and you sort of say over your shoulder, well, I hope it works out, right? Like there's a whole system in place, which includes maybe parental teaching or driver's ed. There's, there's, there's no assumption that they need to figure it out on their own um, when some of them are drunk. And um, there's, there's an acknowledgement that it is legitimate for young people to want to drive. Um, and, you know, imagine if all we taught when we taught driving was to stop at stop signs and red lights. Like those are important when you drive, don't get me wrong. But um, that is pretty much what consent education is. Like it, it distills down the complexity of a sexual interaction to just one thing, which is very important from a legal point of view, um, but doesn't, so teaching people that one thing, if they don't have a context, they don't know anything about sex, it doesn't, it's, it's like starting with calculus when they don't know how to add. So it's just sort of, it's just inappropriate as a way of teaching. Like, you know about good teaching, you layer knowledge together. So this is like starting with a lesson that is not meaningful because they haven't had the lessons before. I, I also often, um, I'm sure you're familiar with Amy Shallot's work. I, you know, I talk about the sleepover, um, that if as a parent, you want your child to have sex in a way that combines intimacy and commitment and respect and care, there's no better way to ensure that they do that than to actually permit them to do it. And that means that when they're in high school and they're in a relationship, um, if they wanna bring their partner over for dinner, then at a certain point you, you say, well, they're welcome to stay for breakfast. And it is the most awkward cup of coffee you will ever make. Like, you know, both kids called my bluff on that. Um, but I, I think that it's a powerful message about seeing, about recognizing young people's sexual citizenship. And then for parents of children who are younger, I think they're all, there's, you know, ideally you would start younger um, with teaching young people about their own sexual boundaries and to respect other people's sexual boundaries. And I mean, how many times as a parent did you say to your children, don't grab, use your words? So that is a sexual assault prevention message. It's just on us as parents to make that connection. So, you know, if our job, we teach them to cross the street, we teach them to brush their teeth. Like there's so many ways in which we teach them to manage their bodies independently. And then a lot of parents just totally bail on sex. And so I think you get like, I'm not a fan of the apps. I'm like, if you're gonna do it, do the whole thing. Yeah, thank you for that. And, you know, it, it leads me to my next question, which is, you know, something you said in the book that I thought was really striking, which is you said you were disappointed, not, not, and not here, not just in parents, um, parents may be part of it, but you said you were disappointed in communities, the communities that college students maybe arrive to campus from. And I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about what you meant by that. Uh, how are you disappointed in communities? And, and, and maybe some specifics about how you would like to see communities change in order to address it. Absolutely. I mean, I think our big disappointment is in the failure of communities to purposefully develop a sense of sexual citizenship or the, the sexual citizenship of young people, as well as communities' failure to clearly communicate the value of having a sexual project. So, you know, one of the things that was really striking was the number of conversations that young people had had with their parents and their families and their communities about their career, about how important it was to pick the right major and figure out what you wanted to do and get the right internship and like volunteer at the right organizations and, you know, line everything up so that you could be set up for a good life. But a good life was defined by work. And no one, none of the young people that we spoke to told us the following story. No one said, you know, my family or, you know, my uh, rabbi or my priest or pastor or, you know, uh, someone in my mosque sat me down and said to me, sex is going to be a really important part of your life. It's going to be one of the ways that you connect with people who are the most important to you. You need to think about what you want from that part of your life. 
You need to think about who you want to be in that part of your life. And you need to think about how you treat others in that part of your life. And like anything else, you need to practice it. You can't just make it up as you go along. Instead, the lessons that young people got was relationships can come later, focus on your career. And so that kind of community denial of a conscious recognition of what a valuable sexual project is and um, a recognition of the value of people's sexual citizenship was really important. I'll just layer onto this that this was especially the case among LGBTQ students. So one young man, uh, we call him Adam in the book, um, told us a story of growing up in an incredibly conservative Midwestern household and community. And he was thrilled to go to New York and be in New York City where he could sort of be in a gay community. The problem for him was that when he got to New York, he met a lot of gay men who were just interested in hooking up and not actually interested in a relationship. And his community had an impact on him. He really wanted relationships, not just hookups. And he finally found a boyfriend um, and he was really happy to be in this relationship. And he really, really you know, liked, and I don't wanna use the word love because I don't remember if he actually used that word, his boyfriend. But then he said to us, you know, the problem is, is that my boyfriend's really forceful about sex. And then he told us a story about how his boyfriend came back to his room one evening after his boyfriend had been drinking and was pretty drunk. And in Dad Adam's words, he basically raped me. Now, we can't understand that experience of Adam's without understanding the denial of his sexual citizenship by the community that he came from. In other words, the ways that communities deny the rights of queer students to have sexual identities that are legitimate, it in some ways made Adam incapable of understanding that he had a right to say yes and a right to say no to sex. By denying his right to say yes, they made it almost impossible for him to even conceptualize what it meant to have a right to say no. And so that's what we mean by, you know, it's not quite that we're saying the kids are all right and everybody around them has failed, but that's kind of what we argue that like we're, we're sort of, you know, not very judgy about young people. And we think, look at the world that we've made for them. And how could we remake that world in a way that's sort of this kind of hopeful, empathetic vision that runs through the book of how we can remake that world in a way that makes harms and suffering much less likely for young people. Thank you for that. Um, I see, uh, I'm happy to see that we're getting a number of questions that are starting to flow into our question and answer tool. So I'm going to go through those and very soon I'm going to start pulling uh, questions from our, from our stack there. Um, but I want to ask you just a, maybe one or two more uh, questions that I'm curious about myself. So one is um, sexual violence is such a hot, hot button topic for so many people. Um, have you faced pushback or criticism and what has it been? Um, we have not. So in writing the book, there were two places that we were like, can we go there? We're going to go there. Um, and at least two places. And, and one of them was to center race. So, um, so much in the argument. We, I did, we didn't set out to write a book that was about the whiteness of, of campus. And yet, you know, thinking, like thinking, there's a chapter called The Toxic Campus Brew. And it's about um, drinking as a practice of wealthy, white, cis, hetero, masculine privilege. Um, it, so I think that, um, is maybe not what people expect when they pick up a book on campus sexual assault. And so um, I don't know if we were afraid that that was gonna land badly with people, but it was certainly um, a little bit of a different thing than, than we had planned to do. And then the, it was the, the thing that we were, I'm always afraid if I say this, then somebody's gonna come at it. Also, I'm like, maybe, but the thing that we, I, I'm afraid that when people read the book, they will say, that were too sympathetic, sympathetic to assaulters. Um, we we really tried to hold all of the students with compassion. Um, it was very hard for the interviewers and for us because a lot of the stories were very upsetting. Um, and uh, still, you know, if if you stop at 
you know, that student is a terrible person. That's a, an emotional response. It's not an analytic response. And it also doesn't lead to a vision of prevention, right? And so, I think, you know, there's no campus that can screen out terrible people in admissions. And most people, you know, there are many people who don't go to college anyway. So I think we really tried to um, understand the subjectivity, as, as an anthropologist would say, to, 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 to be inside the heads of the assaulters rather than standing in judgment. I don't know, Seamus, if you feel like there were other third rail things that we stepped on. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, this, the, the thing that can sometimes be unsatisfying to people is so many people ask us, what should we do after assaults happen? And, you know, we start from a very different perspective and it's from a perspective that says, well, we don't have much to say about what to do after an assault happens, but we have a lot to say about how we could prevent them from happening in the first place. And part of that is a vision grounded in the idea that like, we're not gonna punish our way out of this. Um, you know, the, the insights that we should have into sexual assault might build upon the insights that we've developed over the last 40 years of the United States' disastrous experience with mass incarceration, where the view was, if we just punish people enough, we're gonna get out of this problem. And Jennifer and I are not arguing, to be absolutely clear, that there should be no accountability. That's not our argument. We're also not, we, what we're saying is we don't really know what accountability should look like because it's not our lane as social scientists and public health professionals. What we do know is that there are lots of different things that we could do to make this really difficult experience less likely. And that's what we're gonna focus on. And I think that can also be somewhat unsatisfying, particularly given the nature of the current conversation. And so, you know, um, there are questions, for example, in the Q&A on Title IX rules, and we have a little bit to say about that, but most of it is gonna be, most of our response is going to be, well, we don't know what to say about that. Like, let's focus on prevention. Um, and in that sense, we are kind of classic public health uh, folks in the ways that we think through problems. Well, you mentioned you mentioned the Q and A, so uh, maybe it's time to go there and to pull out a few questions. Um, although you've just given us this warning that you don't have a whole lot to say about Title IX, I think that people are curious, probably, and are interested in, and you've probably done at least a fair amount of thinking about existing Title IX uh, regulations, ways that they've changed in the past several years, ways that they might be changing again going forward. Can you give us even just in broad brushstrokes, um, you know, nationally, what is happening in terms of Title IX? How is that influencing sexual assault on campus in your perspective? And then, you know, how could Title IX maybe be tweaked um, uh, in ways that you think would be even more productive? I would like to see K through 12 schools um, understand sex education as complying with Title IX, you know, in, in, and doing social and emotional learning um, with starting in kindergarten, age appropriate, comprehensive, uh, medically accurate sex education as a way to prevent um, gender-based violence, which keeps uh, people of both genders, of all genders um, and sexualities from having access to education. So I think that, and, you know, and DeVos's um, handed down rules on, uh, you know, sort of reinterpretation had very little to say about prevention. And it is certainly my aspiration for the Biden administration that, um, and it worries me a little bit, you have two lawyers there. Um, I mean, so I, I would like them to think about prevention. You know, in DeVos's regulation, she said almost nothing about prevention. And I think that we need to really push all of us to, um, lift up how much we could do with prevention. I mean, one of the papers from the Schiff study found, I was first authored by my husband, um, uh, John Santelli, but that paper found that, that young women who had received 
comprehensive sex ed before college that included training and how to say no to sex they didn't want to have, which is not abstinence only sex education. It's just sex education that includes a skills component. Um, those women were half as likely to be raped. That is a big effect size, right? That is as effective as the flu shot is typically. So basically we have a vaccine already for sexual assault and our politicians are failing to use it. Um, so I think that that needs to be part of it. And, and I obviously um, sex education should also be teaching people not to assault people. Um, and other work that I've done suggests that, that it can be. So you see, I've already like, we're really focused on prevention and we're, we really don't have a lot to say about adjudication. We have a lot more to say about what prevention could look like on campuses if people wanna talk about that. Well, let, yeah, what, let's, we should do it. Uh it looks like Dr. Khan that you were going to say something, so I didn't mean to cut you off. But yeah, I was just going to jump in because you know one of the commentators said like Title IX is all about athletics. It actually wasn't. It's about gender equity in access to institutions, and the athletics interpretation just comes because one senator asked during a, a panel discussion of it, "What is this going to do to college athletics?" And the people who'd written Title IX said. I don't know, we haven't really thought about that. Like that wasn't the aim of this. And so it's understood as this athletics thing, but it's actually about gender equitable access to educational institutions, broadly conceived. And so when people ask about Title IX, they're often asking about how to, you know, how are like court, court cases of assaults dealt with? And what we're saying is, let's think about Title IX actually as this, really powerful tool that can build gender equity into organizations. That is its aim. And if we can think about prevention tools that realize that aim, then we can sort of take advantage of Title IX and shift the conversation away from the after towards the prevention. You know, that reminds me of something that you said earlier. You were talking, I think, about like parties and who organizes parties. And it also, you know, there's a part in the book where you talk about the the very way that student clubs are organized and run. Uh, their power structure maybe has a way of reinforcing some of the things that you know are unhelpful or things that we might want to prevent. And and so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit maybe about um, if Title IX were used to promote more gender equity on campus. In your vision, would this wind up affecting what? Would it affect how clubs and and you know student groups are organized, or what? What would it affect? How can we use Title IX in, in practical terms? How can we use that to make more gender equitable campuses? So I think, you know, here we circle back to the idea of sexual geographies. Um, the allocation of space, as any academic leader knows, is the most powerful and the most political tool that they have. I mean, I have seen colleagues cry over being assigned to an office that feels too small. Um, but I think at the student level, the allocation of space amplifies inequalities where it could mitigate those. And so, you know, think about the assumption that like older students get better dorm rooms. So what that does is it funnels younger students into those singles when people wanna be alone to have sex, taking people out of a space they control and putting it in a space that someone else controls. Think about um, it, how the party spaces that we describe on the Columbia campus are, are sort of the, the most prestigious party spaces are dominated by wealthy white cis hetero men. Um, so I think troubling with the allocation of social space so that first year students have spaces they can have parties and um, queer students have spaces they can have parties and students of color, you know, I, I think it's, um, it's, it, it's a way of, um, it's not just that they need spaces to like hold events with speakers, right? This is not program space. This is social space because I think then they would, you know, Charisma would not have gone to Brooklyn if there were more events on the Columbia campus that felt like home to her. Um, so I think that that is, 
the most powerful tool that campuses have. Um, I don't think that school should be in the, at the university level should be in the position of providing remedial sex education. I think that they need to use their leverage with the State Board of Regents to make sure it's provided earlier. I mean, if kids were showing up on campus and they couldn't read or they couldn't add, the, they, there would be a word with the, the, um, the K through 12 education system in that state. So I think that using their power politically to make sure that students come onto campus prepared. And then finally, um, there are sort of four separate areas of student programming. There's diversity, equity, and inclusion work, there's sexual assault prevention, there's mental health, and there's substance use. And <clears throat> we want all those people to be in a room together because you can't do the sexual assault prevention without the diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as you know, sexual assaults have mental health ripple effects, not just for the person who is assaulted, but for their friends, because that's, that's mostly who they tell. We have a question from um, uh, somebody in the Q&A here who wants to hear, it's sort of on this theme of, of maybe student groups and clubs and different facets of campus life and how they could be organized. Um, curious about religious circles and groups. Uh, how does religion influence who comes forward um, and who, you know, who has experienced sexual assault, how they're viewed? Uh, and I guess to build off of that on our theme of prevention, how could maybe campus religious life be used um, in service of prevention? If you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, we, um, so in the ethnographic research and in particular in the participant observation, we did a deep dive into two religious student organizations and I'm not gonna name them, but one was a Jewish, Jewish student organization and another was a Christian student organization. And we had ethnographers who spent a bunch of time with students in those two organizations. And, you know, um, uh, it was important to us to have a portrait of religious life and religious experience in part because in the United States, even though a lot of college students are relatively secular, um, um, most Americans are not. Um, and, you know, uh, Jennifer in particular has experience in working within religious institutions, um, and doing sexual assault prevention and sex education and sex socialization within those uh, institutions. We found that um, religious organizations can be good at providing clarity about sexual projects, about articulating what a sexual project within um, a particular religious tradition should be and what a desirable one is. And we think that that is hugely valuable. But we also found that religious organizations, not all of them, but some of them could deny the sexual citizenship of young people. And you know, we make this argument in the book that uh, sexual assault prevention has in some ways been siloed. It's been siloed into like the Women's Center or the Title IX office. And um, we argue that sexual assault prevention that starts in college, as Jennifer said before, really is too late and all of the organizations and all of the institutions that touch people on their way to adulthood need to take sexual assault prevention and sexual education and socialization as one of their primary aims. So religious organizations, you know, the bar can't be that their place is free of sexual harm. Like that is too low of a bar for those places. And alongside religious organizations, I mean, alongside sports leagues and other kinds of places, there are real moments for education for young people. And let's be clear about like what sex ed is and what we're talking about. It doesn't mean education on the mechanics of sex. It means an education on the morality of treating other people with fundamental respect and recognizing their human dignity. That is a sexual assault prevention message. It's one that if we can connect it then with sex ed, we can do a lot to go to, to reduce a series of harms. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. So um, here's, I think, a great question. And I think this will resonate for a lot of public health folks as well. So given Columbia's characteristics of being a private, uh, urban, elite, et cetera, university, how generalizable do you find your results to be? And how might prevention strategies need to differ from one school to another? 
I'm so glad you pulled that question out. I was looking at it. And I was like, I want to answer that question. Oh, yeah. um, so the obviously Colum Columbia is very particular as a context. What is generalizable from sexual citizens is the ideas. So every campus will have its particular sexual geography and every bunch of students will have their, the range of sexual projects, which may differ very much. I mean, I think if you, um, and then, you know, you can look among students on campus at sexual citizenship. So what we provide is a sort of heuristic for exploring the problem on specific campuses rather than an explanation of, you know, the description that we found at Columbia and Barnard is, um, it's obviously going to be different, you know, in a rural campus, in a campus, um, you know, most college students in America actually live at home and go to a community college. And, and so I think it's the questions about space and citizenship and what sex is for that are generalizable, not, not the description itself. And that is also, like I will just say, what ethnographic generalizability means in general, right? Like when you work in one tiny little town in Mexico, obviously it's not like a big city in, even a big city in Mexico, but the questions that you generate and the ideas are what travel. Yes. Uh, so a next question um, from our stack here, which is, did you hear from students who have perpetrated sexual assault but didn't realize that they had done it. And um, what kind of implications does that have, do you think, for prevention? Yeah, that's a great question because we heard from a lot of people who committed sexual assault and didn't realize they had. Um, and in fact, I think one of the most surprising parts of this research for Jennifer and me was that people frequently described experiences of assault, either perpetrating that assault or being assaulted as having sex. So it wasn't just that people who perpetrated assault described those assaults as having sex. It was often people who experienced what would meet really a, a definition of assault didn't describe it in that way. Um, now, our aim in doing this research was not to sort of convey that all of those people just didn't fully understand the real reality of their lives, right? That they were somehow operating under a fog. In the case of those perpetrating assaults, and for those who, you know, you should get the book and read the book, um, there's a chapter on a perpetration, on people who commit acts of assault. We kind of work through why it is that people commit acts of assault. And I'm using people here, but it's important to note that men commit numerically the vast majority of assaults. And most people are assaulted by men, most people are assaulted by heterosexual men. And so we cannot have a conversation about assault without having a conversation about masculinity and an understanding of masculinity and its relationship to sexuality. Now, to be clear, toxic masculinity isn't the only explanation here. So the LGBT community has some of the highest rates of assault and it's not toxic masculinity that's producing that. But masculine cultures, in particular cultures where men are highly attuned to their own sexual project, which is sexual pleasure and relatively ambivalent about the sexual uh, citizenship of others really produces a context where sexual assault is more likely. We also argue that sexual scripts are very important to this. And a sexual script is the idea of like, you know, what are the acceptable roles? And, you know, when people uh, 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 are in a sexual situation, um, the, the understanding that most of them portray to us is that it's the man's job to advance the sexual encounter. And in a cis hetero context, the woman's job to block. And that sort of view, um, you know, helped produce a lot of contexts where assaults and harms were produced. From our perspective, then, a lot more work needs to be done in terms of uh, helping, in some instances, people understand their right to say yes and no to sex. But in many other instances, people understanding that the other people that they're with are people and that they have also the same right to say yes and no to sex. And I'll just give one very quick example here. Um, 
a story that we heard more than once and that has resonated in the dozens of times that we've given talks on this book is a story of a woman who very abbreviated told us, you know, um, I just gave him a blowjob to get out of there. Meaning she performed oral sex on a man in order to m most easily get out of the room. And we don't see that experience as an assault. It's not an assault. She chose to perform oral sex on a man, but we do see it as a fundamental failure of many men's sexual citizenship. Their recognition that like the women that they're with are not there for their sexual pleasure and that the, the women that they're with, you know, are not obligated to perform the sexual acts that they want and that they're sexual citizens who have the right to, to their own sexual self-determination. Thank you for that. Um, I am all, I'm trying to read across uh, questions because we have a lot of them now in the Q and A, and and to try to like bring together themes that I'm seeing in them and and create sort of one uh, question for you. I know how frustrating it is when you're a participant in a seminar and you really hope that your question gets picked. So even if you don't hear the exact wording of your question, I'm trying to get to the basic theme. So one theme that I saw across a few of these was, what are some of the roadblocks you think that, that we are facing in terms of either campus administrators, you know, or how campuses are maybe necessarily organized and structured because they have a job to do, provide higher education. But what are the, some of the things that are getting in the way of us doing this much um, broader and holistic uh, pre you know, prevention um, movement that you're advocating for? Wh why aren't we doing it? How do we get to those root causes? What's stopping us? I think that um, the right people are not in the room. Um, you know, our A game in public health is not telling people to act better, right? Like, I mean, certainly there is a role for behavioral prevention, but we know about multi-level interventions and it's, it's, I think we've rarely given a talk to a public health audience, so I don't need to explain the, the, the importance of multi-level prevention. Um, but so, for example, um, on the community, on the, the um, administrative advisory board for SHIFT um, was the vice president for housing and dining. And he had never seen himself as a sexual assault prevention stakeholder. And as we were talking about the fact that when the bars close down at 4 a.m., there is nowhere to go for students but a room where there is a desk, a dresser, a desk chair, and a bed. And so students end up in an environment that can be easily misunderstood as sexual because there's just nowhere else to go. And so Scott, um, made one of the cafeterias open all night. And which is a sort of classic public health, change the environment. And so, I, you know, the, the people who are tasked with prevention, it really is much more of a compliance mindset. Like let's show that we're doing something because we can't do nothing. And it's certainly better to do something than nothing. I mean, when I was in college, all there was was the take back the night march once a year and that was it. And so we have advanced to at least an articulated institutional commitment to there being less sexual assault. So that's good. Um, but it's not, um, you know, they're, they're just funded to give presentations to people that provide information that don't even develop skills. So if you like, I hope everyone in the audience knows what effective public health work looks like. And that's not what campuses are doing. They're not um, putting the money into it. They're not creating a multi-sectoral uh, sort of committees, right? So like if you had a sexual assault prevention committee that included the people who are responsible for space allocation and the people who are responsible for religious life uh, and the people who are responsible for how, for door, for roommate selection policies, which are very complicated and political, um, those are people need to be part, need to see themselves as sexual assault prevention stakeholders. I mean, we felt like it was such a big win. I don't know if you've ever been to Columbia, but the lawns are beautiful. And one of the reasons they're beautiful is because students are largely not allowed to walk on them. And as, as Scott integrated this whole spatial analysis, um, 
the the year after we did the research, student orientation included a carnival on one of those lawns where they had a bouncy castle, which is like the worst thing that you could imagine for the grass. And I'm like, yes, we beat the grass, right? Like, I think that that's what you need is you need to bring those people in and help them see um, what it would look like to, to, uh, to intervene in a multi-level way. Thank you for that. Another one of these sort of like cross uh, cutting questions, uh, I'm seeing a theme where people are wondering um, if you collaborated with the violence prevention offices that were maybe on, you know, on campus as you did this work. And then um, I guess the add on piece to that is how have you collaborated with grassroots, you know, we have a system of what used to be called rape crisis centers or now, you know, sexual assault prevention centers uh, that are funded um, often primarily through the Centers for Disease Control and by states, but we have a real network of grassroots workers in every state in the United States who are engaged in sexual assault prevention and, and many of them have been using a public health approach for, for now going on two decades. So in what ways have you been able to connect with those either on-campus violence preventionists or off-campus uh, groups and, and what have you learned from doing that? So as Jennifer mentioned, the model that we used for our research was a community-based participatory research model. And we had a fairly intensive community-based participatory research model. So I'll just, um, you know, often when, when people do this, they kind of like meet with community members then they do their research and then they meet with them again. And um, Jennifer noted that we met with the students every Monday for two hours, eight to 10. And those students were, um, you know, selected in part to represent the diversity of student experiences. One was the head of Greek life on campus. Um, two of them were the heads of the primary anti-Columbia um, sexual assault activist group. Um, that was actually pretty um, uh, uh, um, robust in how anti-Columbia it was um, and in its activism. Um, we had student athletes, we had international students, queer identifying students, student leaders, and then a lot of students who kind of, in their own words, didn't really do anything. And so, you know, we built in a range of organizations to that, and it was a sincere community-based research model. I mean, we did not have our research instruments designed before we entered into conversation with those young people. They saw the earliest drafts of our survey, of the um, diary, of the interview protocol, and they gave us suggestions on them because you know we had conversations like, what does a hookup mean? Because it can mean lots of different things. And while that's useful for people navigating the world, it's really bad if you're a social scientist and your concept has multiple different meanings. And so you know we worked with them on that, but it wasn't just the student activists we also had an institutional advisory board. So as Jennifer um, just explained, the person from housing and dining services was really important, but also built in the institutional advisory board were members from the Title IX office, members from the Dean's office, members from counseling and psychological services, um, a range of institutional stakeholders who met with us on many, many occasions and had similar experiences as the students were given input into how we asked questions. Not sort of, you know, scientific input on how to word a question, but input who of people who had a lot of practical grounded experience, and then who, in addition to that practical grounded experience, were gonna be the end users for um, the, in, the output that we generated. And to be clear, Sexual Citizens is not the final output of this project. There are many, many other outputs, including a white paper um, that Jennifer and Claude wrote for the institution that came with much more you know, particular uh, recommendations. The challenge for us is that we really do believe in that community grounded work. And so it would be irresponsible of us to like drop in to West Virginia and say to West Virginia, here's how you need to organize your sexual violence response and prevention efforts because we ha wouldn't have done the work. We wouldn't actually know what it's like there or in Hawaii or in New Mexico. 
And so the value of our work, we think, is in being really grounded in a community analysis. And then as Jennifer said once before, generating a heuristic or a framework that other researchers and community members can take and use in a similarly community grounded experience where if a community is gonna pick this up, if BU was gonna suddenly say, you know, we want sexual citizens to be the thing we use, um, that they would have to do so in light of a much broader community engagement. They couldn't just adapt what we've done wholesale. What they would need to do, what would need to happen is engaging with the ideas and then building community in. And happily, places are doing this. I mean, Stanford is redesigning its sexual assault prevention right now in light of our work. And their Title IX office is has this, you know, um, sexual projects quiz and a discussion of the value of sexual citizenship. And so we love to see it. Like we're really happy to see it, but it's not an off the shelf kind of treatment. It's a set of concepts that need to engage the various stakeholders who can talk about the particularities of the place in order to, to take those concepts and make them sort of the community's own. And one thing I would add to that, I mean, we have presented to the to, to many state coalitions. So we presented to the Maryland Coalition on Sexual Assault in Wisconsin and California. So, so we're like, we are delighted and honored to be in conversation with them. Um, it, a thing that the book makes space for that we haven't really talked about at all is sex that feels degrading or disappointing or embarrassing, but that isn't assault. And, you know, like one young woman said, describing hookups, I just want to hook up with someone who will say hello to me in public the next day. And I, I think that, you know, an avenue forward for prevention, and this is why I think what they're doing at Stanford, is to think about programming that helps students figure out what kind of sex they want to have, right? So it helps them articulate, to clarify their sexual project. Um, because they're very confused about that. Nobody has talked with them about that. All they've heard is not under my roof. Got it. Um, you know, it's a good moment for me to mention that we are joined today by the president and co-founder of the Boston University It's On Us Sexual Violence uh, Club, uh, Sydney Kim. And so I just wanna make sure that for any Boston University students who are present and who find themselves um, interested in this issue, interested in doing something at Boston University that you do connect with Sydney Kim, um, of course, I'm available to Boston University students uh, myself for anyone who wants to continue to talk about these issues. Um, I guess I want to um, start to wrap things up with, with one final question, which is, you know, there's this, the real theme of your book, I, I think, is that um, we need to help young people grow more satisfying, intimate lives for themselves. In just a, in a word or two, can you tell us how do we do that? How do we do that as faculty? How do we do that as a university? Um, how do we do that as as peers? If we are ourselves attending university, you know, how do we do that for each other? How how, how is this? It's a nice thing to say, but how do we put it into action? Yeah. I mean, I think it's something that we need to do as parents of young people, right? When, when my younger son was five and we were talking about the Elliot Spitzer sex scandal, his first comment, cause he's a little bit of a smart aleck was, I hope they used a condom. And his second comment was, it's gross to have sex with someone you don't love, right? So like he was five, um, that's a little bit of a flex, right? Cause we're the sex ed family. But I think that whatever space you're in, you people need to feel supported to figure this stuff out. So I think making space to have these conversations, um, that's part of why religious spaces can be so valuable because there is an explicit values framework around sex, which for people who are religious people can feel very supportive. Um, I think it's, it's late to have these conversations, but um, that doesn't mean it's too late. And I'll just quickly add, I mean, I think it's important to recognize the reality of these young people's lives, which is that 
they're not having lots of sex or more sex than their parents were. They're not having sex earlier. You know, um, there's this kind of portrait of young people today as like sex crazed, you know, super sexually active. And if we compare them to the generation before, they, they may in fact be having less sex and having first sex a little bit later. And so, you know, um, I think that like empirical reality is, is necessary. And I think, you know, just to, Jennifer and I have used this phrase a lot, but like so much of the discussion about sexual assault and young people's sexuality is grounded in the language of fear. You know, the young people talk to us about their sex ed courses and they, they kind of, many of them laughed and chuckled and said, oh, you mean my sexual diseases course? Like the course that talked to them about the STIs they were likely to get or unwanted pregnancy and all the risks of sex. And, you know, we, and, and sexual assault, of course, is a very scary idea, but the book is written sort of with an emotional valence of empathy and hope. And I think that if we hold people, especially young people, with a deep sense of empathy and a hopeful orientation to what the future might bring to them, we can go a long way to recognizing them for who they are and building communities where they can thrive. Thank you for that. Um... I appreciate that answer, uh, both of your answers very much, and I uh, absolutely support the sentiment. And um, I see that we have been rejoined uh, by our Dean, and we are now at a little bit past 545. Um, so I will turn things back over to you, Dean Galea. Thank you, Professor Rothman. And uh, I want to say thank you to Professor Khan and Hirsch. You know, I read the I read the Sexual Citizens book very carefully because I, I had the privilege of writing a blurb for it. And as a result, I, I wasn't sure that I had much more to learn, but hearing this conversation, I realized how much more there is to learn. And Jennifer, you said something about sort of halfway through, which was also my feeling when I read the book, which is, you said, it's a strangely hopeful book for a book about sexual assault. And I actually wish I had thought of that because I would have used that as a blurb for your book. Because I, when I read the book, I also had the sense it's a strangely hopeful book. I thought the insights that the book had about how much context and the world around us matters for something that is portrayed in public conversation as ultimately an individual transaction were, were revelatory. And I thought this came out in the conversation extraordinarily well. I, I thought this was the kind of conversation that could go on for another two hours. And I am deeply grateful to both of you. And I'm deeply grateful to Emily for really masterful facilitation, I thought. And I'm also very grateful to the audience. I've also always realized that um, our um, audience has many different pulls on their time. And it really makes these conversations so much better when we have such an engaged audience. So to everybody, thank you. Thank you again, Professor Khan, Hirsch, and Rothman. Thank you to everybody.